I, I'm just not a fan of following things. You know, I want to figure out the truth, and the truth can come from anyone, but the moment that you organize it into a school, you're essentially saying, believe this, and I'm not interested in believing. Welcome to the Father State. I am Jesse Lee Peterson. The Father State is on Patreon. So click on the Patreon link in the description to support our work. And in advance, gracias. Mamma mia, hola. Oh, you what? No. I have with me a very, very interesting guy today, James Pierce. And he is a coach who writes about philosophy, life, and truth. James, thanks for coming in. Thanks for having me. I totally appreciate it. Are you a philosopher? Uh, yeah, I can call it whatever you want, right? I can call it what I want? Sure. What does that mean? <laughs> I just try to understand things. You try to understand things? Yeah. And so, but do you consider yourself a philosopher? I mean, I don't really feel the need to put a label on it, right? Oh, you just, just, I just do what I'm doing. Oh, you're just doing what you do? Yeah. Without a label at all? Yeah, I mean, if I'm trying to communicate what I'm doing, then sure. So if I were to look you up in the yellow pages on Google, I have to look for doing what you do. <laughs> hey, I, I'm not a great marketer, so. <laughs> and so, um, how old are you? 23. 23. Yeah. And you teach about life and truth, right? Yeah. And what about life that you teach? It depends on what someone wants to learn, right? Like what, for example? What do, well, what do people want to know from you? I mean, everyone's looking to solve their own problems, right? Yeah. So people come, might come to me with all sorts of different problems. It really depends on, on what they're dealing with. I, I focus a lot on the mind and, and the way people think about things. Oh, I see. And so, so let's say I look up on Google and I find John Pierce. I do what I do thing. And I want to know about life. So I come to you and I ask you, John, I want to know about God. Who is God? What would you tell me? I've never met God. I don't really know about God. Would you tell me? That's what you would tell me? Yeah, I mean, I would just speak honestly, right? And so are you charging me to tell me that? Well, if, someone wants, if, someone, wants, if, <laughs> if, if someone wants to talk about God and I don't know about God, I'm not... Oh. I'm not going to teach that what person anything, of thing, right? What type of things do they ask you about? Give me an example. Uh, uh, mostly about finding a sense of peace, right? Like people want to be happy. Yeah. So you talk to them about finding peace. Yeah. Oh, okay. And you talk to them about truth. Sure. And what is truth? I mean, tr truth is <laughs> it's what's true, right? It's, it's what is. What do you mean by that? Well, there, there's no such thing as untruth, right? If it were untrue, it wouldn't exist. So, so no such thing as untrue. But what is truth? That which is. And that which is what? Which is, which exists. Uh, oh, okay. Give me an example. What do you mean by that? Well, so if, if you're, for example, if you're trying to solve a problem, when you find the perfect solution that works every time, that's the truth. That, that's the way it actually works. That's the way it actually is. Okay, so I'm coming to you. I'm trying to overcome being black. <laughs> why, why are you trying to overcome that? Because I don't like it. Why what not? Would you tell me? Why don't you like it? It's not pretty. It's not pretty? It's beautiful, but not pretty. And what would you tell me? Why, <laughs> why do you want to be pretty? <laughs> <laughs> What's wrong with the way you are? Uh, that what you would tell me? Yeah, what, what, I mean, really, what's wrong with the way you are? Oh, okay. How about if I think white is, be, is superior? Uh, superior means like, James, what? James, the truth is white is superior. That's why they call white people uh, white supremacy, something like that. How would you help me overcome that? Well, you, you have to look for the truth of what you're saying. If, if there's no truth in it, then... What's the point of exploring it, right? And so you say there is no truth in that, so. Well, if, if you say, like, if, take you and me, for example. If I say I am better than you, that's such, that's such a broad statement. Or if I say you are better than me, that's such a broad statement. 
it, it's almost meaningless, right? Better how? You, you have to kind of dig into the statement and see what you really mean. And, and when you look I at that... How would I dig into it? Well, you have, you have to question it. You have to question, what, what do I mean by better, for example? And when, like for, with that specific question, you dig into it and you find that it's actually meaningless. Oh, I see. So I dig into it by questioning it? Yeah. Um, how did you become, what got you interested in life and true philosophy? You know, what, that, what, what brought you into that? I wanted to solve my own problems. You know, I didn't want to, like I, I look at people that are 80 years old, they're still dealing with problems they've been dealing with their whole life, right? Mm -hmm. I don't want to do that. So you were walking out the road one day and you just you had all these problems and you decided, you know what, let me solve my own problems. <laughs> I mean it wasn't it wasn't like a discrete event like that. It was more of just something that I came into over time. And how did you come into it? I, I don't know that there was a a specific path I followed, you know, it was kinda of one thing led to another. I heard one thing from one person, heard something else from another person that sparked something in me and so I started kind of exploring the world of philosophy and, and looking for real solutions that work to, to human problems. And how would you define philosophy? Fair question, but I, <laughs> I don't actually have a, a definition for it. You don't? No. Do you know what it is, philosophy? I mean, to the extent that I do it, sure. You know, and I just question things, right? So philosophy means to question everything? I, I guess you could define it as the search for truth, right? And do you question everything? Not everything. Only the things that stick out to me, the things that matter. Okay. What matters to you? Being at peace, mostly. I mean, that's, for me, that's the most important thing, right? I want this moment that I'm in to be perfect. I don't want any problems. And so are you at peace? Yeah. You're at peace. And do you, uh, are there times when you're not at peace now? You know, very, very rarely. And when it, when it does happen, it's very small or, or minute. Oh, I see. So how did, you, how, how did you become a life coach uh, and a philosopher? Well, I started sharing kind of the the insights that I was discovering on Twitter. Um, some people took an interest in it, and then I started a website where I could write a little bit more in depth, and then eventually someone reached out to me and asked if I would help them, so. And so do, do they ask you online for advice, or do they come to you in person? Uh, online. Online. And do you charge them for asking, answering their questions? I, I charge for, like, phone calls. I mean, if someone asks me a one-off question, I'm not going to charge them for that. What, what age group asks you about life and truth and all that? People of all ages. I mean, I, I've had conversations with people my age. I've had conversations with people twice my age. And you're 21, right? 23. 23? 23. Are you surprised when older people ask you questions about life and truth? No, because, I mean, if you look at society, for example, society doesn't have the truth. It's, it's a very rare person that figures out how to actually solve all of their own problems. So it, it's not surprising at all that people go throughout their life with, without figuring that out. How do you know when you have found the truth? The problem disappears and the it doesn't come back. Is there such a thing as a real problem or is it made up? I, I think once you get past the, the kind of basics, right, like food, water, shelter, that, that sort of stuff, I, I think all the problems really are made up. You think they're made up? I mean, for, like, take wanting to be accepted by people, for example. Right. Right? You, you project that need to be accepted. It doesn't just exist on its own. You create it. And how do you create it? Through thought. Through what? Thought. Oh, I see. And so, uh, what type of things have you overcome as a result of searching for the truth? Well, Probably the most significant is the need to be happy. The need to be happy? Yeah. How about other things, like what? Like, I mean, anger, sadness, you know, all these kind of reactive things. Have you overcome your anger? Yeah. You don't have it at all anymore? What's this like not to have anger? Like this. <laughs> Peaceful? Yeah. And what caused you to become angry? Expectations. 
And when did well, that happen? I mean, when, whenever you have an expectation that's not met, you become angry. I, I got a, a question from someone earlier, actually, while I was on my way over here. And they, they basically asked, like, why, why do I become irritated when someone shows up late? Right? Well, it's because you expect them to show up on time. I see. And so you should not expect a person to be on time? Well, no, I, I, think, I think you have to be careful saying you should not. Because now, now you're telling someone, you know, you, you're supposed to be like this, and then that actually becomes a new source of self-conflict. So the, the truth is that expectations create the potential for anger. And then a person can do with that information what they will. So let's say that my producer made an appointment with you for today, and you were to be here at 1 o'clock, right? Or however they tell you, quarter to 1 or something. Mm -hmm. Let's say you showed up at 1. Uh, and she was expecting you to be here at a quarter of one. Once you showed up past that time, what should she have done? Well, I mean, she's, she's free to do what she wants. It depends on what her objective is, right? Um, getting angry is not going to solve anything. Right. I mean, you can take logistical measures, right? Make sure things work out in a certain way when you're trying to go after a desired result. So should she have locked the doors and drew a picture of a finger and put it on the door? I mean, if, if, if that's what she wants to do, she's welcome to do it. It's gonna, one action is going to have a certain effect, a different action is going to have a different effect. It depends on what effect you want, which uh -huh. action you take. Should she have just said, oh, okay, yeah, that's fine. Even though you, you, he was not late at all, but I've been using that trying to get some answers here. Um, should she have just said, oh, okay, he's well, late. So, as long as you rely on the, the idea of should, the, the question actually becomes very imprecise. Oh, it, how should I ask you? <laughs> see, see. <laughs> it, how no, should that's, I ask that's you that's a that perfect question example though. because it's... But it's, if I called you up and said, I tried to interview a person, a person was late, what should I have done? You would have said what? Well, what I have do, what do you want? Word, sure. What do you want? See, should, should only makes sense when you're in a bounded setting, right? If I want to get here, then I should take this route. But if I don't want to get here, then if I tell someone, like, I, you should take this route, that makes no sense, right? It, it depends on where you want to go. Um, what's the difference between philosopher and philosophy? I mean, philosopher is someone who searches for the truth. Philosophy, if you... If you think of it like I've come up with my philosophy, then that actually just turns into dogma. So when, once it becomes a philosophy, it becomes untruth. Oh, I see. You offer one-on-one -on -one coaching. Yeah. And do you coach with men and women or just men? Yeah, I don't see any reason to segregate it. And so, you, so you, do you get questions from women as well? Sure. Um, how would you, what, what's your coaching for? What are you... What's the purpose of it? I mean, I, I coach people because I enjoy it, right? And so is the purpose to bring the people to peace? Well, it depends on what they want from it. I, I, I don't come into it and try to mold them in my image, right? I, I want to help them get what they want. Do they tell you what they want? Yeah, sometimes it takes a little digging, but eventually. Oh, they do? Uh, and what is it that they want? Most people want what so far? How long have you been uh, doing this? Maybe a year or so now. Okay. Um, I mean, I mean every, what do you everyone find wants that happiness. Most people say they want. Everyone wants happiness. It, it it goes by different names. You know, people want this on the surface or that on the surface. But if you look beneath it, it's always happiness. It's always happiness. Which is better, happiness or peace? That's not a question of which is better. It's a question of what inspires a person. Which is everlasting, happiness or peace? Well, well hap I mean, happiness is fleeting, right? You. You know, take a sip of water that satiates your thirst for a moment and you feel happy. But I, I think about peace as, as being content in all circumstances. Okay. Um, so did you grow up with both parents? Yeah. Your father and mother? Mm -hmm. Who were you closest to? I don't know that I was really closer to one or the other. You wasn't close to either one of them? No, I'm close to both of them. I'm sorry? I'm close to both of them. But equally? Sure. So you, you're as close to your father as you are to your mother? Yeah. Have you always been that way? Yeah, as far as I can remember. Well, as a little kid? So um, what do they think about what you do? I haven't asked. <laughs> do they know what you do? Yeah. And they, they don't comment on it at all? 
I mean, we we talk about you know, philosophy, sure, but I, I don't ask people's opinion on what I do because I, I don't really care about anyone's opinion. You don't care about anyone's opinion? Not even my own. You, you don't care about your own either? No. How do you know your opinion is right? I think the two terms are at odds with each other. I'm sorry? I, I think there's no such thing as right opinion. There's no such thing as right opinion? No, because if it was right, it would be truth, right? Then it wouldn't be opinion. Amazing. Um, interesting, man. It was something that you said I wanted to ask you about. I wrote it down so I didn't forget. So you have peace now, right? Yeah. And at one time you did have peace. Mm -hmm. And why didn't you have peace? Because I wanted so many different things. You wanted different things? Yeah. Like what? I mean, you want to be successful. You want to have a good job. You want to have good relationships. You want to be healthy. All, I mean, all these different things. When all those desires go away, they go away either because you fulfill them or because you get over them, then you're peaceful. Do you have all those things now? Most of them. <laughs> what you don't have? I can't even remember what I just listed. I actually, I actually don't even spend any time thinking about what I don't have. Uh, do you have a good relationship? I'm currently single, but I have good relationships with my family or friends. So. But not in, with a girl? No. Do you want one with a girl? I'm sure, if it comes along. If it happens, fine, does it? Yeah. Do you want to be married one day with the family? Sure. You want that? Yeah. Oh, uh, I see. You say that you approach your work from a standpoint of truth. How do you do that? Well, it's about looking for the way things are rather than looking for a way to solve a problem. The, the solution to a problem always lies in the problem, right? It's not some separate thing. Give me an example of how you do it personally. So, so with anger, for example, right? There's, if you, if you look up, like, how do I get rid of anger? You have anger management workshops, right? And that's a solution, but it's not a real solution because it, it's a treatment rather than a cure. It's, it literally, it's anger management. How do I manage my anger, not how do I get rid of my anger? So you have to look at why you become angry in the first place if you want to get over anger. You have to figure out the truth of what causes anger and why you're prone to it. And you say what caused your anger is what you, because you wanted something? Yeah, it's expectation, expectation. or hope or, or you know, whatever, whatever term you want to use. And what, what brings on expectation? I, I think it's more habit than anything else. Right? We're just, we're taught to expect things from others. I see. And so now you have no expectation from anyone. I see, that's a, that's a dangerous statement because expectation can mean different things, right? I, I have no need for anyone to act in a certain way. I'm, I might have like some sort of probabilistic expectation that, you know, I think this is probably going to happen, but I, I don't get attached to, to what I want other people to do or to what I think should happen, anything like that. I'm not quite understanding how you help a stranger because you don't seem to have those steps. You know, if a stranger caught online and asked you a question, they're like, James, um, I want a car, and I, I can't live without an automobile. What would you tell them? What would be the first step to overcoming that? If, if they want a car, there's nothing wrong with wanting a car, right? I, I don't try to tell everyone, like, oh, you should get rid of all your desires because then you're going to be happy. Like, that's, that's silly, right? If you, if you want something, get it. There's nothing wrong with that. I, I'm not the type of person to help you get a car because that's not my specialty. How about if a guy told you, I want a wo woman? Well, I'm not a dating coach. You would say I'm not a dating coach? Yeah. But if, say, if, hey, so, if, some, if, someone comes, if someone comes to me and says, I have all these desires and I realize that they're making me unhappy and I want to stop living this way, then we have, then we have something to talk about, right? Because then that's my area of expertise. Oh, I see. And what would be your first step to overcoming it, all those desires? Yeah, I, I don't think it's really about steps. It's not about a particular methodology. It's just you, you question it until you reach the truth, right? And it's not even about questioning it because you're supposed to question it. It's about questioning it because you have a genuine desire to find the truth. So you would, if, if I called you up, you will question me about my desires until we can see why I have it? Sure, yeah. I mean, that, the only reason that you have a desire you want to get rid of is because you don't understand why you have the desire in the first place. Are you a Christian? 
I, I don't identify with any religion. Do you believe in God? I, I don't believe things. I'm sorry? <laughs> I, I'm not a big fan of belief. You know, so but you the, the only reason a person believes something is because they don't know it's true, right? So if you're, if you're a proponent of truth, then by definition you're opposed to belief. So you, do you don't believe there is a God? How, how would I ask you that question if you don't? How would I ask you about I, I, God? I don't, know, I don't know if there is a God or not. That's, that's the truth, right? It's, so do, you do, you, do you know if there is a God? Because believing doesn't get one anywhere. So do you... Do you uh, I neither believe nor disbelieve. That there is a God? Yeah. Oh, I see. Were you raised as a Christian? No. You were raised as what? I was just raised. <laughs> <laughs> what the... So your, your parents just dropped you out and didn't let you be? Yeah, they just sent me off into the world alone. <laughs> As a no, little I mean, kid? They, you know, instilled their values in me, sure. They did? Yeah. Were they Christians? No. Were they atheists? I, you know, we've never really actually talked about what, what they are. They don't instill any religion in me. That, I, don't, I don't see any religion. So as a little child growing up, are you an only child? No. Uh, as a child growing up, you never discussed God or Christianity or Judaism or Allah U Abba or anything with them? I, I'm sure we talked about it at some point. I don't, I don't really remember. Really? And they never tried to take you to church or anything? I've been to a church before. And how was that for you? It was fine. And what, what did you like about it? I don't know that I liked or disliked it. It was just another experience, right? Oh. So you, are you just like just walking through life without <laughs> like a no, just I don't just, I don't know where you're coming from right now. Yeah, I explain to I, the folks I think what it, you about so they can understand. I think it's a really wonderful thing to go through life without a care. That that's something that speaks to me on a deeply personal level. Without a care. Yeah. And what does that mean to be without a care? It it means you're free. It means you're not weighed down by events that go poorly or even events that go well. It means that thing, things don't weigh on you. There, there's a lovely saying, I forget actually who said it, it's from some Eastern philosopher, maybe Chuang Tzu. And he said the perfect mind is like a mirror. It reflects, but it does not hold. That, that's really the essence of what I'm talking about. And break that down for us dummies. <laughs> well, it means, you know, when something bad happens in a person's life, what do they do? They go home, they spend the next 30 years reliving it again and again and again and again and again. Right. That's, I mean, that's chronic suffering, right? The, I think what would be perfect is if you could go through your life, whatever happens, happens, and you're not going to suffer about it after the fact. So if uh, a wife should lose a husband that she's been with for 50 years, and she, they're like one together, and he dies. She just say, oh, well, he did. He did. Move on. Well, what, if, if she suffers over it, what, what does that bring her? Are you saying she should not suffer? No, I'm not saying that at all. I'm, I'm simply posing the question, what, what does suffering bring? Is there any benefit to it? I don't think there is. Oh, I see. So what would you say to her? She called you up, James, James, my husband died. And I'm feeling pain, I'm suffering. What would you say to her? Well, see, even that, that statement, that doesn't necessarily imply the need for a response, right? It's just a statement, I am suffering. I, I don't even see suffering as something that has to be solved, right? It's just But people there. live that way and people think that well, way. Well, pe people have all sorts of assumptions. I know, but when she calls you up, she's trying to get help. And so James, if, if, James, she, if she asks I'm, for help, she's then not we have as something smart to talk about. You, right? She calls you up because you want help. James, James, I'm suffering. My husband died at 50 years. I'm suffering. What should I do? Okay, see, the what should I do now, we have something to talk about, right? So then we have to understand what it is that's causing the suffering. And inevitably, when, with relationships, it's some sort of attachment, right? She was attached to her husband. Of course. Right. And how, what would you say to her about getting over that? Yeah, I, I don't know that there's, there's any one magic combination of words you can use. I don't even think you can solve that on a hypothetical level. I think that has to come in the moment. Amazing. So what is it like for you walking through life 
not knowing that there is a God or not? I, I think it's only a problem if a person is bothered by the lack of certainty. What do you mean by that? Well, if, if you go through your life thinking, God, I really don't know if God exists, that, that really worries me, then you have a problem. If, if the thought literally never crosses your mind, you don't have a problem. So it never crosses your mind about whether there is a God or not? Well, no, it doesn't, then I'll explain why. If, if there is a God, the problems of my daily life are still the problems of my daily life. If there is no God, the problems of my daily life are still the problems of my daily life. So I'm, I'm not going to rely on some external figure to solve my problems. I'm going to solve them on my own. So you wouldn't rely on God to solve them. You would solve them. Yeah. Oh, I see. And you would solve them by not thinking about them? Well, it depends on the problem. You, you, I mean, every problem is solved by discovering the truth. If the truth about a problem is that it is created solely by thinking about it, then obviously the solution to that problem is not to think about it. What's the primary cause, causes of problems? What's the primary cause yeah, of problems? With a capital P. <laughs> yeah. Well, that, every problem is caused by the desire for it to be other than the way it is. Meaning that people want their lives to be other than what it is? Yeah. I mean, it, there's, there's no problem without a person standing here saying, I have a problem. Do you live in a, a home or a, uh, on the street? In a home. Uh, and why do you live in a home and still live on the street? So I enjoy it. <laughs> could you enjoy living on the street too as a homeless person? I'm sure I could. I don't How see would why. How you enjoy it? Well, it, you know, you can, you can be happy without the material comforts. It's more difficult, certainly, but there's no reason to impose additional suffering on whatever your circumstances are already applying. And the additional suffering that you impose on your situations comes from the way you're thinking about them. So let's, let's try to help the people understand the beginning. All right, so you know you, you're doing this, you understand what you're doing, right? But for a person that doesn't understand and they find you on Google or however they find you, and they want your help because you're a life coach and you're even though you don't want to, you know, tire a philosopher, <laughs> you are a philosopher, right? And so how would you help a lame person get going? It, it always circles back to what they really want. You know, the, the, I, I hate to, to even use the term step because then it sounds like I'm, you know, telling you, like, this is what you do, then this is what you do, then this is what you do. But step one is really figuring out what you genuinely, truly desire. And how would you know what you generally, truly desire? Well, you, you can see it in your actions, right? A person says one thing and they do another, you know that they really desire what they're doing rather than what they say. It, on, on some level, you have to just know. Our society is crazy right now. Would you agree to that? Sure. People fighting one another, they are all, everything is happening that seems to be bad. How would you resolve those problems, those issues? Well, the, the problem is, as long as there's internal conflict, there's going to be external conflict. So there, there's never going to be a perfect solution on a societal level. I mean, you, you can develop systems that, you know, reduce violence or, or strife or whatever you call it. But if you're talking about perfection, total absence of conflict, that has to start on a personal level. How would you resolve the conflict between the races or men and women and all that? I don't really know, honestly. I, I don't follow it enough to know what, what the situation is clearly or... Do you believe all those problems come from inner conflict? Well, every problem comes from inner conflict. Yeah. And what does that mean exactly? I mean, on the basic level, it's, I think, one thing, but I also think this thing and these two things are in conflict with one another. For, exa for example, if I think I'm a very shy person, and I really ought to be more outgoing. Then I've set up an ideal of outgoingness versus the way I am, which is shyness. And those two things are now in conflict. And, and so you would recommend they overcome that by doing what? Well, you just have to see through it. I mean, there, there's, there's always conflict between what is false and what is false, or what is false and what is true. There's never conflict between what is true and what is true. So right. if you search for the truth, your inner conflicts naturally disappear.
So is it a false idea to see yourself as shy and and think there's a solution to that? Uh, could you repeat that? Is it a false idea to see yourself as a shy person and believe that you need to do something to overcome it? Well, I think, I mean, specifically shyness is more a habit than a personality trait, I think. So it, there's kind of a false identity wrapped up in that, but the other falseness is the idea that I should be a certain way. I mean, if, if I really should be a certain way, I would already be that way, right? If should were truth. So you shouldn't think you should be a certain way? Well, it's not that you shouldn't think you should be a certain way. It's just if you want to resolve your conflict, you have to see through that. How would you describe yourself? I don't know, to be blatantly honest. So if someone asks you, you when you think about yourself, you're like, I don't know. I actually don't think about myself that much. You don't? No. What do you think about? Whatever I'm dealing with at the moment, or ideally I think about nothing. <laughs> what do you think about this conversation? Right now I'm not thinking. You're dealing with this right now, right? Yeah. But you're not thinking about it? No. What are you doing? Listening. Talking. Oh, I see. And are you making up your own words? The words just come. I don't know where they come from. You don't know where they come from? Oh. How, are you being honest? Yeah. You're telling the truth. If, if I weren't telling the truth, then I would have to think about it. Uh, uh, so that's how you know you're, being, you're telling the truth? You don't have to think about it? Yeah, that's one way. Uh, okay, interesting. Do you believe that human beings are in a fallen state? This show is called the fallen state. Do you believe human beings are in a fallen state? Uh, what, do, what do you mean by that? Um, have you ever heard that phrase before? Uh, only from you. <laughs> oh, uh, oh, yeah. I believe that human beings have fallen away from God. So they've fallen away, they've turned away from life. And they're living death by living in the darkness. Well, I mean, if, so if you replace the word God with truth, for example, absolutely. I mean, there is practically no one that really discovers the truth in the world. I mean, and the evidence is that everyone suffers from problems, right? If they found the truth, they wouldn't suffer from problems. And so does that mean you do believe that human beings are in a fallen state? Yeah, absolutely. They're falling away from truth? Sure. And truth is God? I, I think the only possible conception of God that makes sense is, you know, infinite, all things, and that which is, right? And that which is, we've already said, is truth. So truth and God have to be synonymous. I mean, if, if, if God wasn't truth, would truth be greater than God? Wouldn't the truth then be the new God? Do you believe there's good and evil? I, I think that we have very conditioned conceptions of what those things are. You believe they exist, but we just have different well, conceptions we, of what they are. So there's, there's some truth underlying our conceptions of good and evil. Evil, for example, like the, the truth underlying our conception of evil is malice, right? If someone has ill will towards another, we think of that as evil. The, the actual concept of evil, if you really break it down, doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense? No. You believe it exists, but it's, it's in the person, it's of the heart. Yeah, I mean, if you want to talk about malice, right? Uh, what causes evil? I, I really don't know. You don't know? Have you ever thought about that? Uh -huh. not, not, not deeply, because it's, it's never been a problem that I've dealt with personally. And I, I, first and foremost, I'm selfish, right? I want to solve my own problems. So what? If, well, first and foremost, I'm selfish, so I want to solve my own problems. <laughs> and so you don't think about evil? I, I haven't thought about it much. You believe it exists, but you just haven't. No, thought. I mean, it, I've explored the the concept, I, like, and I just said, right? Like the evil, evil as a concept actually doesn't make any sense. It doesn't exist. It, it exists purely on a conceptual level. But the grain of truth in it is ill will or malice. Have you ever had a malice heart? No. You never have a malice heart your entire life. No, Not I mean, I mean, around, sure, right sure, things you know come up when I back when I was younger, right? Someone pissed me off and I wanted revenge, right? But, but never on a, some deep core level was I a malicious person. 
Does people ever take you off now? No. Uh, and does it bother you to hurt other people's feelings? Because I asked you about I the mean, mask. Do you yeah. wear the mask before the show started? You said, yeah, you'll wear it inside a store because you don't want to upset you, yeah, other it's, people. Yeah, it's a, I mean, it's a fair question, right? It, it doesn't weigh on me heavily, but I, I obviously like, you know, I like other people. I'm a compassionate guy. I prefer not there to hurt feelings that I don't have to hurt, right? And so you put, you, you wear the mask to keep from hurting their feelings? I, yeah, I mean, it's a barely an inconvenience to me, right? And how about if you're walking down the road and some lady like, put on your mask. She had on two or three masks. <laughs> I don't know. And she like, put on your mask. Would you put it on to make her feel better? I don't Outdoors. know. I don't, honestly, I'd have to be in the situation, and then I'd just act. You, you would have to be that's, in it. So that's, that's the, I actually wrote on Twitter the other day that the over-examined life is not worth living, which is my pithy take on the old, I think it was Socrates that said the, the unexamined life is not worth living. I, I think so many people like overanalyze all their decisions, right? That, that's a perfect example. That, that's not something that you need to... I go through some internal debate about. I already know that if I'm outside and some old person walked by and tell me to put on my mask, I'm just going to yell at them, go sit down. Am I wrong? Uh, that's another false idea is right and wrongness. That goes, that's the same as good and evil. You don't believe there's a right and a wrong? No. Right or wrong? It just is? Yeah. I mean, so if I don't is, is, this, is this chair being white right or wrong? It's not white. You're wrong. Factually incorrect. Right. But we're talking about moral, moral right and wrongness, right? So am I wrong for yelling at the person, or should I just say, oh, okay, I'll make you feel good, put it on? It might be unkind, or it might, might be any other you know, perception that the person has, but right and wrongness just, just don't make sense as ideas. What's going to happen to you when you die? I don't know. I'll find out when I get there. Oh, that'd be too late. What? <laughs> what is uh, effortless stoicism? Well, that that was because you write about that. Yeah, yeah. that was something I Sto I initially wrote it for Ism. Twitter. I mean, stoicism, and that not to be confused with the school of philosophy, because I'm not a stoic that follows the school. I'm I'm talking about the quality of emotional, you know, maturity essentially where the things that happen don't affect you, don't elicit emotional reactions. And the truth about becoming stoic is that it happens effortlessly, it happens naturally. It doesn't happen because you're trying to become stoic, it happens because you reach certain understandings that then take all the power out of the events and those events no longer trigger, trigger emotional reactions. So what is, how, what is stoic? Well, I mean, stoic, it, Essentially, it's peaceful, right? It means that things don't disturb you. And so stoicism is what? Stoicism is what? Stoicism, stoicism. is the, the quality of being stoic. So you said there are two types of stoic, stoicism. Ism. The quality and the philosophy, right? Yeah, there, there's a, an ancient school of philosophy called stoicism with a capital S, and then there's the quality of emotional being called stoicism with a lowercase s. Oh. And, and that's not some deep philosophical point. That's just linguistic. <laughs> and when did this, how did this get started, this idea? Of stoicism? Yeah. I don't know how it got started. How old is it, the idea? Oh, a couple thousand years old. And how did you, so are you for that or are you against that? You don't agree with that? I don't, I don't think it even makes sense to look at it as for and against. It's all about what appeals to a person, right? Be, you, being stoic appeals to me. Are you stoic? Sure. You would consider yourself a stoic. Yeah, I, I think on a fundamental level, it's synonymous with being a peaceful person. A peaceful person is going to naturally be stoic. So, stoic sound dead. What? Stoic sound like a person that's dead. Yeah, I, I get that a lot. It's, it's actually not true. Um, you know, pe people tend to have this idea that if you know, events lose their power over you, you're going to become unfeeling, and that just isn't the case. So you just mean you don't overreact to anything? Yeah, I, I have the power to react when I want to react and not react when I don't want to react. 
Are you an emotional person? No. Have you ever been? Yeah. And what caused you to become emotional? It was always some idea that I had, some expectations, some hope, oh, some desire. It's, it, it's always internal. I read that there's a, and I believe you wrote about it, a very popular Stoic philosophy, right? Uh, what is that? Because a lot of young people seem to be getting into it. Yeah, that, that's the Stoicism with a capital S that oh. I mentioned. So there's a capital S Stoicism and a lowercase. Yes, yeah, so that's that the Stoicism, the philosophy, was the one that like Seneca and Marcus Aurelius and Epictetus talked about. And those were like ancient Roman philosophers. Did you get that from them? No, I actually I haven't read all of their work. Even that the stuff I wrote about Stoicism was just based on my own experience. And so why is it becoming so popular now, especially with young people? Well, I know, I know Ryan Holiday wrote some books about Stoicism. I think he probably deserves some of the credit for the popularity. Um, but it's, you know, it's appealing because when you become Stoic, you naturally become more effective. So that's why a lot of uh, young people have started to grab hold of, hold of this? I mean, I, I can't speak to anyone individual's motives, but I know it's popular among like business people or athletes and they're trying to improve their performance. If you become a stoic person, you naturally become a better performer. Is it something that you make yourself become or does it happen to you naturally? Uh, just speaking from my own experience, it happened to me very naturally. I mean, I, I can look back and I can see the causality that, that you know, made it happen. But it wasn't like I molded myself in some image. It was just a process of discovering, you know, the truth about the reactions that I have, and then seeing through those. So, to understand this better, you uh, you don't overreact to anything. I'm wary of saying that because then you know something's going to come up, and I'm going to have some big reaction. But I, it's been so long since I've had an emotional reaction that I can't even imagine having one. Oh, okay. Um, so why, you, why aren't you into the philosophy of it? I, I'm just not a fan of following things. You know, I want to figure out the truth, and the truth can come from anyone, but the moment that you organize it into a school, you're essentially saying, believe this, and I'm not interested in believing. Do you have a leader? That I follow? No. You, know, you follow no man? And what's that like for you? Means I'm, I'm doing what I want, discovering what I want to discover. So I may be, I may have already asked you this. What is the first step into becoming a stoic? Yeah, the, I mean, the first step is honestly asking yourself why you want it. Because I think a lot of people look at stoicism and they think, "Wow, that would be so great. I would feel so good if I was stoic." And that motivation is going to sabotage your effort from the very beginning. Because a lot of the reason you have the reactions that you have is because you have some hope, some expectation, some desire. If you look under that desire, the reason you have that desire is because you want to feel good. So if your motivation for pursuing stoicism is to feel good, you're sabotaging yourself. Is it real or is it made up? It's some what people, real? Can, can people pretend that they're a stoic, but it's really not? Their nature is not well, you, real. Yeah, you, I mean, you can pretend on the outside, right? But the inside, you can't fool yourself. You're going to have that torrent of thoughts running in your head. Because some people really want to be that way. They want to stop overreacting to life, yeah. the issues of life. So they hear you talk about being a stoic. And you tell, but you don't tell them how to do it, right? Well, because there is no how. There's no it's how. Like, it, if I ask you, how did you get angry at that after you have some, you know, incident where you're angry. There's, you didn't have a how that you followed to get angry, right? Just like I'm sitting here, I'm a relatively peaceful person. There's no method that I'm using as I'm sitting here to be peaceful. I'm just peaceful. Uh, are human beings naturally stoic born that way? That's a fair question. I, I don't really know. I think as they develop, they are conditioned in, in various ways. Um, it'd be interesting to see a person that wasn't conditioned. I don't know what that would look like, but I, what I find is that as you decondition yourself, as you learn the false premises in your thinking, you naturally become more stoic. I noticed that little children, before they're traumatized, 
they don't overreact to things in life. They hold no grudges and they accept what is. Is that yeah. stoicism? Yeah, I mean, that's the, that's the mirror-like mind that I mentioned earlier. Oh, okay. Oh, amazing. Should people put effort into life? Any effort at all? I think effort is is really another form of self-conflict. Because effort, if you look at it, is a, a product of essentially thinking, I should do this, but I don't really want to, so I'm going to apply effort to it. When a, when a person genuinely wants to do something, it's effortless. So I think it's much more effective for someone to pursue something that is effortless for them than it is to live a life of effort. What's your talent? My talent? <laughs> Finding the truth, because that's what interests me. Um, I want to quickly, because we run out of time, yeah. ask you about the younger generation, millennials and Zs. Are you a millennial? You're a millennial. Or I don't, I don't even know. You don't know? I'm 23, whatever that is. Um, what's your observation of the, the people who are a little older than you, millennials as opposed to the Zs? Do you see a difference in the generations? I mean, there might be some behavioral differences, I really don't know, but hu human beings, by and large, haven't changed over the past couple thousand years. I mean, you, if you go back and read Marcus Aurelius, he talks about the way people are that he deals with, and they have the same qualities they have today. Who was that? Marcus Aurelius. And so he was a philosopher way back when? Yeah, he was, he was a Roman emperor and philosopher. A Roman emperor? Yeah. Where is he now? Dead. I rest my case. <laughs> no, I'm playing. <laughs> so, hey, that's where we're all headed. Uh, are you going to die one day? As far as I know. You, you, you believe you, you will die one day? I mean, that's, that's what all the evidence points towards, right? Does that concern you at all? No. Not at all? No, if anything, it's freeing. Amazing. So listen, I got to put my guests on the hot seat. I gotta put you on the hot seat. Okay. And I need you to answer these questions as quickly as possible. All right. All right. The hot seat. Is the love of money the root of all evil? No, I think desire is. Is it ever okay to tell a woman she's fat? I think the concept of okay doesn't make any sense. Would you date a fat woman? If I wanted to date her. Uh, what is love? Something that can't be put into words. What? Something that can't be put into words. Is there only one truth, or does everybody have their own truth? There are many truths, but I, I think it's dangerous when you start looking at, as, looking at it as something that you own. Is it normal to have anger? Well, if you judge normal by frequency, then absolutely. Is it okay to lie? That's back to the concept of okay. <laughs> Do you trust the media? No. Uh, what is the best quality um, that a wife can have? I think there is no best. I think it's about the relationship, what the person values. What is a man? Man is a word. How do you define it? Uh, wh what is truth? That which is. Amazing. Did you have fun? I did. Thank you for taking on the high seat. I appreciate it. Tell the folks how they can reach you. Yeah, I uh, have a website, which is james-pierce.com. Uh, I have my writing there. I'm also on social media, Twitter and Instagram. My handle is J-I-M-M-P-I-E-R-C-E. -E. Do you smoke pot? No. Have you ever smoked pot? No. Why not? Why? You want a joint now? No, thanks. No, I'm saying. <laughs> I don't have a joint. Thank you all for tuning in. I absolutely appreciate it. Let me hear from you. And don't forget, click on the Patreon link uh, for in the uh, description to support our work. Check out the merch. Like, follow, subscribe, share, ring the bell. And I absolutely appreciate it, folks. Thank you so much. Thank you, man. Yeah, thanks I for having me. Next time on The Fallen State. You match men up together. I match men and women. Mm -hmm. Men and women. Yes. Two women or... A uh, uh, male and female. Whoever, everybody. But for two men or two women to get married, it's not real. What year are you in? It's 2021. Are you a Christian? Yes, I am. I love the Lord. Amazing. Mm -hmm. Better. <laughs> <laughs>
So you think that when you get to the gates of heaven, do you honestly think that God is going to say, you're not a man, you're not a man, you're not a man, you're not a man, get out. Absolutely. He ain't going to let you in. He won't have to say, get out. He's not going to let you in. He won't open the gate. In the Bible that I read, the New Testament that I read, uh, love is love. I'm a great person. You may be a great person underneath it all. If you can't see it, that's completely fine and perfect on your behalf. Thanks for watching The Fallen State. We need your continued support. Donate to my nonprofit here. Subscribe and like the videos here. And tell everybody and their mama about the show. Thank you.